Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a very special guest and that's Dominique, one of the co-founders of IOTA. How are you going? Hey, how's it going? Really good, thanks. And you're traveling around New York for a month and uh, IOTA's been really busy lately. But for those that haven't followed your work, uh, tell us a bit about your background and how you got into IOTA. Yeah, right. So I originally come from Northern Italy. So I come from a very boring background where I lived in the mountains. <laughs> so it was very beautiful. Uh, but I was always intrigued by technology, right? So I was, since it was like 12 or 13, I was always on my computer and on my gaming stage, PlayStation all the time. And from that early experience where I was basically trying to make money online, I really came into this whole Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency space. Because at the time where, when I was starting to make money online, I wasn't really able to create a bank account or to create a PayPal account because you had to be over a certain age to, to do that. Yeah. And so I was like excluded out of participating in this economy. And as I was introduced to Bitcoin, right? So it's really being able to transact globally, no barriers, no age restrictions is really permissionless. Yeah. And that's what really intrigued me initially. That's, that's what really convinced me that blockchain and, and DLT is really, and cryptocurrencies has really a future. Yeah. And so then I started out with mining uh, and made, uh, some success with that and then uh, at the later stage I thought hey like what is the biggest uh, business opportunity in this in this space it was always very entrepreneurial and so I realized a cryptocurrency exchange is the next big thing yeah. <laughs> and so I tried to set that up I invested a lot of money with that and and also raised some money with that but at the end of the day, it failed simply because I, I was really faced with these with those huge hurdles, which was banking, legal, and regulatory issues. Yeah. And so that was sort of my first failed <laughs> endeavor. Yeah. And after that, I, I was still in the space full time. I I first, by the way, I first got involved in 2011, full time 2012, and then in 2015, together with my three co-founders, which are Sergey Popov, Sergey Vanchenko, and David Sunsuba. Uh, we co-founded IOTA, and that's been my main focus ever since. So what was the thought process like, I guess, between all of you? Most people are pretty familiar now with uh, Bitcoin and blockchains and how the miners work. So how did you um, think up this uh, Tangle technology? And do you want to maybe explain in a basic level how this works with the, with the nodes? Right. So I think the exciting part about IOTA is that the four co-founders have a very diverse background and also interests and expertise. So the two surrogates are really the mathematical and computer science geniuses. And, and they were really involved or created NXT back in the day, which was like the first full proof of stake blockchain. Yeah. And so they had this really deep uh, uh, tech background and knew how DLTs work and how they should work. And the way that we started with was really what, what, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And the problem that we are, were trying to fundamentally solve was this trust problem in IT. Right? So we need to be able to trust the data that we get from machines. And we need to be able to trust the processes that make up those systems around us. Because you, you know, there's all of these news that, that get released weekly where it says, hey, like this and that uh, uh, website or this and that even company were hacked yeah and now we talk about mission critical infrastructure that also is potentially at risk yeah and, and they're, they're like we really are not just leaking data but we're actually risking lives because what if a factory explodes and and what if something goes wrong there and so we need to fundamentally change the way that we secure those systems so that's the first part, right? Data security. The second part is really how can we make sure that machines become truly autonomous so they can start transacting with each other. Yeah. And in this, what we call really this machine economy, one machine pays another machine for data, for services, and so on and so forth. And and realizing that this is the problem that we want to solve, the, the, the main realization is obviously, hey, you need to have a distributed ledger for that. But DLT itself is not there yet. Even back then, we, we we came to the realization that transaction fees are too high. Uh, there is a scalability limit, and we need to make sure that we create a new technology that is really able to solve those bottlenecks of blockchain and to really be a, a problem solver for for what we are aspiring to be, right? which is this machine economy. And that is how the Tango came to be. And, and Sergey Popov and Sergey Vancheva have already back then been thinking about DAX, so directed acyclic graphs. Yeah as a fundamental architecture for block, for a distributed ledger. And they've worked out the concept. 
and we've been basically really fleshing out the, the fundamental concept ever since. But the main thinking behind the Tangle is really, hey, what if instead of utilizing this one-dimensional chain where we have blocks and blocks appended uh, after each other, and this, uh, this, this consensus is done by miners, why don't we get rid of the blocks, the chain, and the miners and make sure that one transaction can be issued by everybody? And if you issue this transaction, you are basically being part of this consensus. That means you don't delegate it to somebody else, but you yourselves are confirming two transactions in a history. And through that, you increase the security of the entire network, and you're also being an, a validator. Yeah. And because you're participating in the validation process, you don't have to pay transaction fees. And it is sort of the main thinking behind the Tangle technology and, and IOLA. And recently, you guys took a big step forward in removing the coordinated node, which I guess people can think about as a watchtower or an overseer until we release this in the wild is the way I describe it. So how, how is that progress coming along? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe I should actually give some background into why we had a coordinator. Yeah. So uh, there is this interesting thought challenge. So think about launching the Bitcoin network today. So you have this existing infrastructures of GPU, FPGAs, ASIC miners that are really there to really jump on a new network as soon as possible. Yeah. Right. And if you were now to launch Bitcoin, there would all of these miners be racing against each other. And potentially somebody would have a majority of the network and would be able to double spend. And you know, as soon as you have a distributed ledger, which is supposed to be immutable, having such a vulnerability that you have a double spend, the entire premise of it is gone. Nobody yeah. can really trust it. And so what we did initially, we, we basically said the network needs to launch with those training wheels, which is basically this coordinator slash compass that guides the network in the validation by simply issuing these periodic milestones that are referencing the, the, the valid subtangle. Yeah. And this is something that, that, that was a similar practice as in Bitcoin. When Bitcoin launched, they also utilized that. Yeah. And since the inception of IOTA, we've always uh, said that we are going to remove the coordinator eventually. Yeah. And so obviously we had to refine our thinking and our standing. And because we are, we are probably the leading uh, research uh, entity when it comes to DAX, we really um, improved our understanding of really how to remove the coordinator over the last few years. And uh, I think like two or three weeks ago, we really released Cordicide. Yes. And the main thinking there is that we now have a concept whereby we don't need to say, hey, we need to have X amount of nodes, X amount of transactions to make sure the network is secure. But the network is fundamentally secure through our security proofs. And that we have act, fundamentally what we brought forth is a completely new consensus algorithm yeah. that is really improving upon this Tangle concept. And now we are really focused on working together with universities to make sure that the concept itself is provably secure, yeah. some parts of it. And we're also obviously working quite thoroughly on, on the implementation itself. So I think over the next few weeks slash months, we're going to release the first alpha network so okay. people can participate in the network, which will be quite exciting. So it will be like this first glance of, of what the future might look like. But the actual, uh, the ultimate goal is obviously to launch this on the mainnet. And it will take quite some time because at the end of the day, we have a protocol that is worth billions of dollars. So that is why we are focused on involving universities and the community to basically battle test the network that we are releasing. So can you give us a, like a general overview of how this prevents uh, like the double spans or, or chain splits? Is it sort of randomly selecting nodes to, to do those checkpoints or is that sort of getting too technical? Yeah, exactly. So I think fundamentally the, the easiest way to explain Cordicide is that we have more communication amongst the nodes. Okay. So think about a beehive or an ant hill right the uh, the single node the single entity itself is rather dumb because it cannot sense and feel the entire environment but what if the ants or the bees start sharing data with each other yeah through that you can make much smarter decisions and this is really the fundamental concept behind cordyside as well that we start to implement some sort of voting of what is right and what is not right and through that you can get finality much faster and you can also make sure that double spends and so on and so forth are really fought 
and they're not able to succeed in this network and the majority really wins. Is this uh, similar in some ways to what uh, Hashgraph is talking about with gossip and gossip about gossip and that sort of thing or slightly different again? Uh, it's definitely different. Uh, one thing that we have to keep in mind about this entire distributed ledger space is that there's a lot of innovative concepts that are very innovative in their domain, but none of them so far have succeeded in combining these different components to yeah. really have an overarching new consensus algorithm. That is basically what Bitcoin did. Bitcoin yeah. combined uh, hashing, they combined proof of work, they combined the blockchain in that and created the blockchain through all of these different concepts yeah. to have this new consensus algorithm. And so we are taking a similar step whereby we have taken some concepts of others, introduced our own concepts and improved upon other concepts to really have this, this holistic approach to core decide, but it's definitely not similar to Hashgraph or Avalanche or others. Okay, fantastic. I, I appreciate that uh, description. How does the IOTA token fit into all of this, especially in that uh, no fee environment compared to Bitcoin and Ethereum where we, where we do pay fees? Is it the currency of the network or how does it tie in? Yeah, so what we see IOTA as is really a machine currency. So I, I always say re lately that our goal is to bring the currency part back into cryptocurrency. So it's not just speculative assets, but it's actually that IOTA becomes a currency that has real utility. And for us, it's real utility is a value transfer, one machine paying another machine for a service. So we really fundamentally see ourselves as this backbone of this machine economy and this, this backbone of IoT. And, and the real benefits of IOTA is that the settlement layer itself is incredibly cheap, right? Yeah. There's no transaction fees. So yeah. you can really do micro payments. You can really do this on-demand economy whereby you pay only for the service that you utilize, for the resource that you utilize, and not more. And that really brings a new layer of trust. Because if you think about why were cryptocurrencies, why was Bitcoin and blockchain invented, it was to get rid of contracts. Yeah. Right, so you no longer need to trust the other party, but by simply utilizing micro payments, for example, you can really remove this layer of trust. Yeah. As soon as the payment stops, the resource flow stops. As soon as the resource flow stops, the payment stops. Yeah. So we have no fees, but hopefully we have millions or billions of devices actually paying each other with IOTA being that currency. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the best way to really describe IOTA is really this next evolution in IoT. IoT was about automation. How can, I make, how can I make my machine and my network of machines smarter by connecting them and by making a decision in some data center or and, and sending that decision back? Yeah. Right? It's really about accumulating data to automate the processes around us. And what IOTA is, is therefore, is this next evolutionary step, which is a full autonomy of machines. Because what we want is automation, but also autonomy, so that all of these processes around us no longer need our involvement. But machines can also make decisions on our behalf. Yeah. Like, for example, now my vehicle paying for the parking station or my vehicle paying for the toll station yeah. or even for the electricity and so on and so forth. And, and this really completely unlocks new potential. One is really reducing costs for big corporates or for consumers, but it's also enabling new business models. So now you can really also as a consumer participate in this new economy by renting out your Tesla vehicle or by selling your data. And, and so that's that's really the, the huge potential that, that lies there. The next thing I wanted to ask you about was that wallet. I know something that beginners find hard to understand is why can't I store some of the, the most popular coins just on a hardware wallet last year? And I think people don't understand that you've got to write this software from scratch. And if unless it's a fork of Bitcoin, we're really pushing the boundaries. And um, that IOTA wallet was a bit buggy, but the latest update of Trinity uh, is a lot better, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think many people don't understand how IOTA was started. IOTA was started by four people that have basically never really met or were able to sit together in, in a dormitory in Stanford or something like that. We really started in a very resource constrained environment. We only raised half a million dollars and in our token sale. And through that, we had to fund the entire project, right? And so it was very difficult initially to really have a fully working wallet. So. But the exciting part now is obviously we have a very, very beautiful, stunning and user friendly wallet, which is called the Trinity wallet. And it's been security audited twice. And just yesterday it launched as a full product. So now it's available on iOS, Android and desktop. 
And in my opinion, it's definitely one of, if not the best crypto wallet out there today. It's all open source and it's really a wide label solution so big companies can also utilize it. Awesome. We encourage people to uh, give that uh, new version another try. I guess a, a, yeah. a follow on question was how, how lightweight is the Tangle um, for all the devices compared to that wallet and you know CPU usage, memory, battery, if we've got all these Internet of Things devices and sensors, how, how lightweight is the Tangle? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the best things about IOTA is compared to Ethereum, we don't have what's called like state transitions. Yeah. Like in, the in Ethereum, we really have to tra transition the entire state to get to the recent state. Yeah. to really know what is true and what is not true. And in IOTA, because we use something similar to uh, 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 the account system, you're fundamentally able to delete your database. So basically your local data, your local Tangle database that stores all the transactions. So now what we enable through a process which is called local snapshotting yeah. is that you are able to delete your entire database up to a certain point where you no longer care about it and you only store the latest state of all the addresses because what we are all only there for is really uh, a trends of value, right? Money, or, but also data. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is obviously that we really focus on making IOTA integrated into uh, machines. So we have these um, um, cryptographic algorithms that are accelerated. So we have some some quite exciting partnerships with some bigger um, um, semiconductors that we're working on right now to make sure that we have this hardware acceleration. But lightweight and IoT is definitely a big focus for ours. And another thing is we have a new node software that has been being tested, which is called B. Before that, it was called ICT, so ICT. And yeah. it basically allows you to host a full node in uh, on a Raspberry Pi. So just really small devices that can then participate in the network. Yeah. But fundamentally, I think we also have to understand is what does the future look like? Or will my coffee machine be an IOTA full node? And the honest answer is no. Like, what is the point of that? Most likely, your smart hub in your home station, which will be have the capacity of a Raspberry Pi, will be able to run a full node. There's no point for your uh, coffee machine or for your light bulb to be a full node. Yeah, w one thing I researched recently, which I found interesting, was like cloud versus fog computing, and which devices yeah. actually need to talk to talk what that what level of security everything actually needs. Yeah, exactly. So I think oftentimes people in this blockchain space really overcomplicate things. They want to blockchain everything. And so there's always this mantra, hey, decentralize everything, but does it really solve a problem? And and I think people need to really start thinking more about the system architectures, how it will look like in the future. So one half is obviously, hey, what does the blockchain and DLT architecture actually just do? And the other part is how do I integrate it into a, a big corporate's existing infrastructure? Yeah. And how does it actually look like the communication? How is the security look like? And so both of these are very, very complicated topics. Honestly. Yeah, I guess uh, does your coffee machine need to be as secure as a million dollar Bitcoin transaction? Does it really matter if someone exactly. ha hacks your coffee machine? Um, yeah. Just on that, do you are you still uh, really bullish on Bitcoin and Ethereum on specific applications? And as you say, you sort of see this tying together. Right. So I think I think the Bitcoin dominance will not change anytime soon, simply because it's like the gateway to the entire crypto space. Yeah. And the big advantage that Bitcoin and Ethereum and others have is that they have a very uh, advanced or like built out uh, 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 investment infrastructure. Yeah. So it's much more easier for an institutional client to say, hey, I'm going to allocate five, ten million dollars of my fund into either or or Bitcoin because they're part of a custodial solution. Right. Yeah. And so that will take time for solutions like ours to really catch up. Yeah. And I think both of those projects definitely have to resolve the fundamental problem of having utility outside of speculation, um, especially with Bitcoin. I think I think there's more progress to do on that side as well, especially yeah. with uh, rising transaction fees. And the same also with Ethereum, right? The most uh, interesting applications there are really around gambling. There is no big corporate running on the Ethereum mainnet. Maybe that will change in the future, hopefully. Yeah. But we still have to get there. And I always call this like crossing the chasm. Everything, or, or like everybody always calls this crossing the chasm. The technology chasm uh simply because everything today is a proof of concept 
Bitcoin, even though it has a, a multi-billion dollar uh, valuation, is still a proof of concept. Yeah. Right? It hasn't fundamentally solved a, a huge problem and it's not mainstream ready. And it's the same with IOTA, it's the same with Ethereum. So we need to make sure that we cross this chasm. Yeah, constantly being developed and improved. Ethereum's got their, their big 2.0 coming up. And I think people sometimes just forget that every day we're kind of pushing the boundaries for all projects. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, do, you, exactly. do you want to talk about some of the uh, partnerships you've got the smart city going in Taipei um, and other sort of fu future applications or partnerships that you're excited about? Yeah, I think the most exciting partnerships that we have right now are definitely on, on the smart city realm, simply because we really think that smart cities will be able to help us get the adoption that we hope for. One is also a government entity that's involved, but the government really has a lot of push in the market. They can really tell companies to, hey, like let's innovate together. So we have a partnership with the city of Taipei, which is going quite well. I was there last month, I think, and, and that is progressing. We have a company that which, there which is called D-Labs, which is like an IOTA startup. Yeah. And we're really working together with the gov government. We have a partnership with the city of Austin, uh, where we're working on, on mobility test beds. So that was a quite exciting announcement. And so hopefully we will also get some funding uh, from the government for that. And in Europe, we also have a partnership with, uh, or we we co-founded a consortium which is called City Exchange, and so this was uh, funded by the European Commission for around 20 million euros, and there we're working together with seven cities on smart energy districts, and so we have some exciting progress there as well that we that we're going to share with the community on on what we what we've been working on. And I think the most exciting part about IOTA is that we're not just one industry. We're not just mobility, not just supply chain, not just energy, but we're all of those. And then combining those is really the exciting part, right? Yeah. So the vehicle, which now has a, a, a car wallet, is able to buy electricity, but is also able to sell ele electricity. If there's like a peak load in the grid, now the, uh, the vehicle is an energy producer. Yeah. And it's able to earn money with that. And I think combining all of these concepts is really exciting part of what we are working on to make sure that this machine economy and, and our entire economy is actually able to function on these new principles. And, and other announcements are definitely also in the hardware realm, because that is what we are really focused on as well, really getting more on, on, on the hardware level. And in general, we, we're making a lot of progress. Our big focus for this year is to stop doing proof of concepts. Because I think everybody's kind of getting worried, worried about those because there's nice showcase, but they don't fundamentally solve a problem. Yeah. And we are transitioning really towards test beds where you have these success stories that you can showcase what you've done with one or multiple companies. And you write a report about that, which is really like a sort of feasibility study. Because I think one thing that's really lacking about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and DLT in general is like, who has really quantified the benefits of utilizing a cryptocurrency or a DLT? So we have like Gartner or, or those big companies or consultancies that say, hey, like this is going to unlock $3 trillion of new economic potential. Yeah. But then a single company is going to say, hey, like that sounds really great, but how much money am I going to save in my industry? So nobody has really done that yet. Or how much money can I make now with this? So it still has to be a lot more concrete. And I think this is what we really focused on. Yeah, that's what people want to know as a business when you approach them. And I guess uh, yeah. well done. It's amazing that you only raised half a million dollars and what it's turned into compared to the, the ICO space in 2017. Um, how are you going in terms, you mentioned that incubator in terms of funding projects. Have you guys uh, got, got a, a big foundation or how does that work with grants and getting people to use IOTA? Yeah, I think one of the most exciting parts about IOTA is really the community. We were always like a community oriented project. When we did our ICO, um, the founders and the foundation had no pre allocated tokens, which in today's terms uh, sounds really absurd because <laughs> every like, yeah. Ripple and those projects get like 60% of supply yeah. and they have a big war chest. But what we did is we went to the community and said, like, hey, if you want to have a non profit foundation, you have to donate money. And I think that's very unique about IOTA. And the same thing we did with our ecosystem development fund. We came to the community and said, hey, we really see a lot of potential to foster innovation in the ecosystem, but we need money for that. So they donated around 20 TI, which is in today's terms about $4 million, yeah. 5 to $45 million to, no, wait, no, no, $10 million. I got my calculation wrong, yeah. $10 million. 
Yeah. And, and those $10 million are right now being utilized to really help the ecosystem. So we are focused purely on open source projects that are really these multipliers in the ecosystem, like modules or really exciting um, open source projects that showcase the true potential of IOTA. Or the research projects that we're really focused on now as we core decide. Fantastic. And there are some there have been some really good uh, projects there. I think one thing that's really different about us than other projects projects is that we are not participating in this pay to play game. Like if a big company comes to us and tells us, hey, give us $10 million, we're going to integrate you into our wallet. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something we're going to engage with. We are really focused on this organic growth. And that's really paid off. Because I think pay to play only goes so far. And, and you really need to have a loyal base. And I think the, the IOTA community is very loyal and they're very productive and one of the largest definitely in this ecosystem. But people are focused on really building and innovating with IOTA. Yeah, I think lately we've seen lots of more centralized projects spring up and what it's done is swing that pendulum back to the whole decentralization and community and things that yeah. the space was maybe more about to begin with. Yeah, Yeah. no, exactly. And I think, I think projects like Libra and so on and so forth are actually helping the entire cryptocurrency space because they make the benefits of DLT of a permissionless cryptocurrency so much more apparent. Absolutely, yeah. The next thing I wanted to ask was, um, well, a project that's been in the news a lot lately is Chainlink and the importance of Oracle. So how we get data from the real world uh, into the blockchain or the Tangle. So what's your approach with all these devices and all the all the data that they're going to be uh, putting into the Tangle? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I, th I think the the good part about IOTA is that we're really focused on being a data transmission layer. Yeah. So you can really uh, transfer data uh, with IOTA. Yeah. So we we say all say we are value transfer layer. Right? Yeah. Value means for us money tokens, but it also means data. So you can really utilize the IOTA uh, permissionless ledger without having a token. And so we see IOTA as really an important part of transmitting data from from devices and from there you can really derive the truth and we have another protocol which builds on top of iota which is called cubic yeah just like called quorum based uh, computation and from there we really was want to bring the trust in in this in this decision making right so you can trust and you can make your decisions based on on the oracle's output fantastic so that is on some work in progress for for us as well that, that, that we are focused on right now but I think oracles are very important for smart contracts. We are really more focused on how can we deliver authentic and immutable data to a process as yeah. well. So for example, a factory process, how can you make sure that this machine actually transmitted that data? Yeah. And for that, you don't need another protocol. Something like IOTA works really well for that. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Um, the, I guess the final question I had was about uh, the future. Uh, you know, we always ask our guests about this world with the Internet of Things and all the devices yeah. and augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, how do you see uh, IOTA tying into that? What would you love to see the world look like in 10 or 20 years? Uh, so the way that I would like the world to look like in 10 to 20 years is definitely it's a lot more equal. Right, so the power and money is also more evenly distributed. I think the main reason why I also joined this space is to empower people, to to bring really opportunities to everybody around the world, not just people like you and me that are privileged to have the internet and to have found out about this amazing stuff. So really about empowerment, and and I think uh, technologies like ours really empower people because it also helps them to focus less on things that don't matter and really focus on, on their self-purpose, yes. like learning and who they are and what they can really contribute. And like everybody always says, the internet was there to enable this free information flow. Now, cryptocurrencies there are there to really enable this free uh, flow of assets, right? Monetary assets. And it's so powerful for the future. Now, every now somebody from Africa can just build the new stock exchange can just build new um, asset exchange and so on and so forth. And I think that's very empowering and very exciting to have this free flow of assets. Now, obviously, VR and AR are also something that we are that's true to our heart because I think our technology can really be applied there. And many of the founders are also gamers or used to be gamers before it would happen. Yeah. And so I think there's some some great ways to to, to combine those two. I think I'm 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 personally really more also excited about 
what does distributed machine learning on top of IOTA look like? And, and how can we be a part of that? Uh, so, so there, like, for example, I'm, I might be like going off on here, but, but I think there's this interesting thought, right? So think about the Tesla fleet today. It's, it's really smart because one Tesla is sharing data with another Tesla. Yeah. And as such, the Tesla ecosystem is getting smarter and smarter and smarter. But now what is the incentive for the Tesla vehicle to share data with the Volkswagen vehicle or for the Tesla company to share data with the Volkswagen company? The only incentive is really money. We need to have this monetary incentive for one company to share data with another company. And I think this data economy in the future will really be huge, where people really own their own data and they can decide what happens with the data. Do we want to sell it? Do we want to keep it? And that will also radically shift the way that products are being advertised. Now, it's no longer you buy a new phone and you the company is able to completely extract all of your data and make money off of that. But instead, you can really start making decisions on that data. And I think that will always take a long time for, for this data ownership and this data monetization to truly take off on a consumer level. But on a corporate level, it will definitely happen within, within the next five to 10 years. Because fundamentally, uh, data should be part of your balance sheet of a big company because it unlocks new revenue streams. Yeah. And I think that will be very exciting for the future, what it will enable. Final question. We recently had a gaming week and you mentioned gaming then, so I'll, I'll ask you as well. Do you have any thoughts on simulation theory? I mean, we, we're going into this future uh, where we're going to be surrounded by machines and you know, immersed in this technology. You mean the simulation theory that we are all just a simulation? Yes. Yeah, like I find that interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not too much of an expert on philosophy to give a good comment on that. Yeah. I, I always ponder all the time about what, what is the true meaning? But at the, at the end of the day, it's really to to feel and to experience and to change, I think. And, and those very core fundamental questions are, are very hard to answer. Yes. And I think it's, it's better to just move forward, right? I, I completely <laughs> agree being, with that. Instead of being stuck. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great... There, there, like, there's, there, there's a lot of problems to solve on this earth, I think, to, to make it more exciting and to make it more prosperous for everybody. Yeah, indeed. I think that's a perfect place to finish. So thanks so much for joining us today, Dominique. I'll put the links to everything in the description below and I wish you guys all yeah. the best. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, guys.